Sorry, that took me a minute. I don't know why. This ground is being weird. Let's see if Dennis comes back for more. See if Dennis comes. Oh, for the bludgeoning. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Plum Thumbs, how are you? Is Dennis going to come back? Dennis! You see the invite there, Dennis. You also sent me a thing. Play kicks in here in a second. Come on. Can you see me or what, Big Man? I know. <laughs> uh, what was your question again, Jay? I can see you. I'm sending you the request. I don't know. This did this last time when I was with, uh, who was it with? Colin and, uh, Matt. No. Um, uh, Kenko and Zanko. Zanko. Listen. I can see you. Dennis, does it show up? Dude, the background's sick. <laughs> There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, was just, I was just about to kill it and try again. Yeah. Did, uh, yes. did, uh, did you see Jay's question? I didn't. What was it? Uh, so, so if you if someone you offer sort of option two, one, two, or three, how do you deal with callbacks? Um. Yeah, no, I'm here. How, what do you, um, like, how, how do you what, deal with the, how do you deal with the callback? You mean like a price complaint or something's wrong with the job? Something's wrong with the job. The tech goes back to fix it. On his dime? Yeah. If it's yeah. something he did, if it's something he did, if, and so, there's more, if there's more work to be done, we sell more work. Okay, so what do you do with the dispute of your your your, your plumber did this, but you know you, we've all had that call, right? Where you where you fix on the kitchen tap and now the toilet are you the toilet's plugged and now the kitchen tap leaks? Yeah. How how what was your strategy for that? Or did you have we have try, we try we definitely have a strategy. We try to make it right. We we come to agreement. We do not want to argue with our customers. So we will. We will try to educate them. Most people are reasonable and they'll go, okay, I see you were here, but this isn't, you didn't cause this and we'll sell some more work. Um, but I would always coach, just make it right. Like we want the customer for life. I want the customer to call us back over and over and over. Yeah. I want them, every, I see every house as an ATM machine. And sometimes they call <laughs> us, sometimes they call us, they get 20 bucks. Sometimes they get 40, sometimes they get 200, right? So I don't care. Well, no, them. you get 1700 yeah. Yes. So and sometimes they get 6000 right, if they right. want to take this or whatever. So, But I want the customer to call me back over and over and over. And so we try to make complaints. We deal with them very quickly. We prioritize them, and we make it right as, as amiably as possible. Okay, that's fair. Is, yeah. No, I... Um, I would agree with you. We do the same yeah. thing. And sometimes you have to, you know, sometimes you're like, listen, I, I understand where you're at, but this has nothing to do, A has nothing to do with B. I'm yeah. sorry, but that doesn't. Yeah. And usually That's people, can, they, they, want it to, they want it to be different, but they'll see usually. So, so he's got a thing here. For example, hydraulic has a plug screen, so they chose a cheap option. Okay, so he's saying they chose the cheap option, but they clearly needed 
a you know option four instead of option two yeah yeah so if they chose if they chose the bottom option first of all we don't want to come back and so if it's not going to work we're going to have to go back and say hey obviously look here we, we tried that we tried that i was willing to do it it didn't quite work out we're gonna have to do a little bit more and so this is what we're looking at and most people appreciate that we'll go with it yeah i do i mean i there is no silver bullet like some people are just jerks some people mm -hmm. you know are gonna work you're gonna have 15 different plumbers in their home you know what i mean yeah um is that your girlfriend in there dennis i am single <laughs> okay here's, no. here's a tough question for you why'd you get out if you love well, it so know. much i'm gonna be controversial if you love it so much and you were so successful at it then why the hell did you get out it didn't i was offered so much money it didn't make sense to stay <laughs> love it I'm, I'm serious. It's like I know. Partner, I love it. it what other answer is that? I loved. I loved. We had a. We had. We had a beautiful company. We had. We had training labs. I. I built my own people. I loved working with people. And when I look back, what I like most is working and building these young guys up. And and the, there's this 20 year old kid. One of my last hires. I didn't hire him directly, but he was there. I knew him. I, I knew of him when he was hired. One of my managers hired him. Um, he's doing so well a year out, like he's doing so good. He's only been there a year and a half and it's just, everyone's so proud of him. And those are the, those are the stories I, I'm not a part of anymore. Right. Cause they, cause it's not my company anymore, but yeah, it just didn't make sense. Like my partner, Kimberly, she came to me and she's like, look at this. Like we had, we had a friend say, you guys should look at sale and you know, you don't understand what you're saying no to. And, um, so, um, so we kind of we said, well, what are you talking about? It was it was not in our radar to sell, but it just it just made sense. Yeah, that's and that's I don't. If, there's nothing further than that. I've been approached three or four times over the course of my career where people have said, "Listen, we want to buy you." I'm like, my number's eight. Yeah. They're like eight. I'm like eight million. Yeah. You want to pay me eight million dollars? Of course. Yeah. And I'll hang on for a year or two. Did you do that? Did you hang on for a year or two as sort of mentoring, or did they escort you out the door the day one? No, we could have whatever we wanted. We could choose. Um, I had this dentistry apprentice thing. I really, I'm really passionate about helping these young people get going in the trades. And so I had that to move on to. So I stayed for three months. Um, I just came to the meetings and stuff, but I wasn't super involved. And But Kimberly, my partner, she stayed on for almost a year. So. And she's out now because it's been over a year. Yeah. 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 Would you, and if the opportunity presented itself, would you build another one, or do you have like a non-compete? I have a non-compete. Um, I can't work in my county or the county neighboring my counties. So if I if I left the county in the middle, so like five counties type of thing. Yeah. I basically. mean, I, I, that's that's I realize it's that if your county is like a you know yeah. whatever. A square, then it's you know, whatever that is, four oh, yeah, counties yeah. around or five counties around. Is that how yeah. it works? Yeah, I, I need to leave a county I have not done business in between the two, and so I could start in several places in our state of Washington. Um, but I think um, I'm really enjoying helping. Um, like, there's so much demand. We need young people, and there's so many people not doing it right. There's there's so many people not charging the right price. I so agree. They can't afford the dentist. So that's kind of where I'm focusing on. Um, yeah. So you we'll more see. of a are you more of a into the apprentice sort of guild, or are you looking at? I mean, we had that conversation offline, so I guess I'm bringing it online. Is are you focusing more on on sort of? Uh, uh, the guys that are just getting into the trade, the guys that already have a business, like a, from a business angle, or as my suggestion is, are you getting into the elementary schools? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at the elementary school, but I'm in the high schools. So yeah. I regularly, I'm, in, I'm regularly in the high schools. Um, the Skills USA, have you heard of that? No. We're in Canada, but. 
they probably, you guys probably have more of this than we do, but this Skills USA is doing incredible things in the high schools. And um, so I'm getting more involved with that. So and actually this Thursday, I leave for North Dakota. I'm going to meet uh, Brady, the apprentice. PHCC is sponsoring this kid. And I'm taking him to Washington, D.C. to meet his government and all this stuff. And then he'll be at the national championship. And he's a fantastic uh, a plumbing apprentice. So I'll be yeah, telling just, his thing how late that. We just had this up here. So the, one of the beautiful things, one of the things that Canada has done right from a government standpoint, and there isn't many. Yeah. <laughs> but I would agree. They have, they have unified the apprentice, pro, the, what, it's called Red Seal, the Red Seal program. So if you're a plumber, electrician, like a, a millwright, a baker, uh, you know, um, a carpenter, sort of anything within that ilk, um, there's a four, there's either a three, four, or five year program that is nationwide and is recognized nationwide. And you can go and if you, if you, you know, uh, graduate with that red seal, then you can work anywhere in Canada. Um, uh, they will want you to take just some, cause every province has its own little, uh, code updates just because of where they live and, you know, basically, it's environmental changes to the code. Yeah. Um, and with the exception of Quebec, which someone no doubt will say in here, um, we can work anywhere we want. And and there's not a there's, there's very little deviancy between those things other than sort of very localized code. And we just had up in Edmonton. Um, uh, our our skills competition for the province and whoever won that gets to go to ottawa to compete in their uh in the nationwide thing yeah. right yeah and um so it's very very similar it's 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 called skills trades something i sh i i i'm embarrassed that i don't know the name i should know the name i don't uh it just happened last weekend and i reposted a bunch of stuff on it but um, I, I mean, that's, that's been around for a long time. And as you know, the tr trades have been sort of dismissed for so long into sort of, you know, well, you're not very good at, uh, writing. So we're going to put you in remedial cause you're a bit dumb and you can, you know, go work with your hands cause you're a bit of, you yeah. know, uh, you're not all there. Yes. And even my experience coming out of high school, I went to university for a couple of years and then decided to you know go back to the trade and took a lot of flack for it. like what are you doing man what are you giving up for like that i mean okay well if you want to give up then give up i'm like and it kind of put a chip on my shoulder to say you know what man you guys i'm going to prove all you guys wrong and how wonderful the trades can be and to be perfectly blunt about it i have like everybody that i sort of in my peer group that you know I went to our engineers or, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, don't live as fabulously as I do. Yeah. <laughs> and I live a fabulous life. Yeah. Who is this? How do you do your, um, your pricing? Dude, you're going to you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to watch for, uh, you have to watch version one. I'll do it. I, I've done this before. I've done it a live one man shop exercise. Like when I train my guys, I would just go live on Instagram. That's a fabulous thing. That's one of the things, because I've done the Next Star thing. I did whatever I was, what was it called? Something 2000? Contractor 2000. What's Con that? Contractor 2000. Contractor 2000. So I did that way back in the day. I did the E-Myth thing. I don't know if you remember that, that <laughs> when it sort of came around. I did the whole whatever. <clears throat> so, like I say, I don't... I don't come at it just like some angry old man that thinks everybody's crazy. I'm, I'm just looking at it from a, this is what works for me. This is what's made me very successful. This, I'll, clearly, you're doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that's kind of the point, is that once you find your baseline that you're talking about, then however you make that baseline, it is your, it's your cake. Like, bake it and make it fabulous and, and work it. You know what I mean? And find out what, you know, like we have done, find out what works and what doesn't work 
what is stupid, what is fabulous, and sort of, you know, narrow your focus. It, and it's like you've said a few times on here, like we could talk for hours because there's, you have, you know, between the two of us, there's, you know, 53 years of business experience. You can't wrap that up in like, you know, an hour, hour and a half and say, okay, do this and you'll be successful. It's just, exactly. it's impossible. So how, so Bob, how many years was it before things really started clicking for you personally? You know, that's a tough question because my, there was a lot of sort of external pressures going on when I was running my business. It sort of affected my decision to, to downsize. Yeah. And, and some of those, you know, I'm happy to talk about other ones, you know, are just sort of personal uh, crosses to bear, if you will. And, uh, you know, once I sort of shed that, I did feel a, a bit of that imposter syndrome. You know what I mean? Trying to, and I didn't have a partner. It was all me. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody that worked for me, I had to pay. There wasn't sort of anybody that was willing to chip in and say, listen, I'll, I want to be partners with you and I'll help you do this. Everybody that showed up at my door, for lack of a better word, was with, had their hand out and said, you want me to help you? It's going to cost you 50 thou or you want me to help you with this? It's going to cost you whatever. Yeah. So, 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 so when I sort of shed that, what I felt for me was sort of the facade of trying to be a big company and slimmed it down and sort of took control of my life because I really did feel like it was, you know, you know, I was sort of a slave to the business, right? Because it needed me. And I've seen those posts, like, how do you become the least, mo least important person in your business? And I'm like, you know what? I don't, I don't think that's really, <laughs> it wasn't possible for me. So I would say probably 2015 is where I just sort of all, came, you know, I'd done it for uh, almost like 19 years since 96. Yeah. And that doesn't mean there was good days and bad days and great years and bad years, but it always just was what people, uh, it was just a grind is what it felt like. It wasn't really much fun. It was paying the bills. There was lots of other stuff going on. And I guess that's part, the beautiful thing about that is because I was able to sort of remove myself from the day-to-day -day and focus on some you know, personal family issues, it was great. And then when that was over, it was like, listen, I don't need this anymore. I need to focus on this business if this is what I'm gonna do and yeah, so it's, I would, like I say, 2000, that's a long answer, but yeah. 2015 is yeah. sort of where I just felt like I had both hands on the steering wheel and was going in the direction I wanted to go. Yeah, for us it was, so we started in, um, well, the company started in 76, and um, when I came on board, we had not been to $2 million yet. So that was just a small mom and pop shop, really. Yeah. And like four four service plumbers and you know a couple of install crews doing sewers and water lines and three pipes and stuff but it took us till about the same time it took us about 15 years to um really we had i had a i had an older guy that really successful here in seattle told me um when i went to flat rate when i switched to flat rate it's such a big deal you think it's going to change your whole world and he's saying flat rate's not going to change your world it's when you do enough things right that's when it's going to work yeah. And so we kind of took that. And so we would work on something and it would we'd get excited. Like it was going to change our world, but not quite. It was better. But so we just kept on working on things. So it wasn't as much drudgery for us as, okay, what's the next thing to work on? Right. And we would look at our numbers and our data and say, well, our conversion rates down. So we need to work on our, our sales process. And, and yeah. what I, 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 I learned that a flat rate sucked by itself. Like I wanted options to let people buy from me so they didn't feel like they were over a barrel. Which here's the, here's another thing we didn't get into, which is to give options, you got to know what you're doing. Yep. Right? An which is part, of tech, my, is part of the process, right? Yeah. An, ex, an experienced tech only can come up with one or two options. And so then that fed us into, well, we got to really train our guys technically as well. Because flat rate, what it did was, Honestly, they just taught sales to people, and they people could sell, but they weren't really good plumbers necessarily. When flat rate first came out, 
And so I, I saw that and that's not what we, that wasn't our value system. And so with the options, it forced you to, to either hire competent people or, or make them competent in your own program. Right. Um, and that's the difference, right? Like that's, I mean, you talk about that a lot about finding and making quality employees. Yeah. And, and just like everything else we're talking about here, it's easy. It's incredibly easy to say that, you know, the problem, process behind making that a reality is is particularly when it, there's so many variables in your in your neck of the woods and you know what market you're after and you know what i mean and what your margins need to be and what your burn rate all that sort of stuff you're like how do i fit all that in and and become successful at that and just like you i think that's what it was is you just sort of say all right this isn't working for me this is what i'm going to work on I'm going to spend six months on this. That's now problem solved. Here's the next problem I got to solve. Here's the next problem. And so, as you sort of work your way through the muck of running a business, you sort of, without even realizing it, you sort of rise out of the muck. You know what I mean? And now you're in, you know, clear water and then you're on dry land and then you're on a you know, beautiful paved path. And you're like, I don't know what I was stressed about, but lots of these guys, which is my part of my concern, they have started their businesses in the last couple of years. I'm like, dude, there's some muck ahead of you. Like, it's just, you got you, you got to walk through the muck. And your, yeah. I think your mission and part of what I'm trying to do is say, here's where the deepest sinkholes are. So let's try and stay away from there. It's not going to save you from, you know, getting your boots muddy or up to your knees and, and, you know, garbage, but it's it certainly can, you know what I mean? Ease your path through it. Yeah. Is what it is. Yeah. Because you have what, no matter what anybody says, uh, you know, and lot, and I've talked to lots, lots of them and so have you that have, you know, are sort of geared two, three or four into the business and like, yeah, it's going all right. You know, there's a few things I'm like, yeah, it's coming. Like it's coming. Where are you going to grow? Are you going to stay the same? Are you, you know, what, what issues, you know, Frankly, personally, are you going to have whatever those might be that you have to deal with? Um, it is, uh, Boiler Crew just said it, like it's mucky as fuck. Is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've said this for a long time. I think I, one of my premises is I think there should be less better run companies. Does that make sense? There should be less companies but better run because I think a lot of these guys go into business for themselves because the company they were at didn't know how to do it well and they weren't growing. No. So there's nowhere to go. There's like, well, the sun's going to take over the business. And so, or if that idiot can do it, I can do it. And like he yeah. skipped the paycheck and I, my trucks broke down. He can't, I've been telling him over and over, I've got a, I've got no tread on my back, dual tire. Yeah. But, and so then they go into business for themselves and charge a little bit less than he was and think they're going to get rich. And so I, I, I think, if we can get more companies doing it right and taking care of their employees, then some of these, some of these one man shops that should not have no business being a business for themselves. Like that's just not their personality. They, we need beautiful, we need wonderful craftsmen mm -hmm. teaching the next generation yeah. and getting paid well to do it. And so I think bad run companies do a disservice and force guys into their own business. And, 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 and then they get stuck there and then they get bitter and then they get frustrated and then they get old and then they quit and they haven't trained any apprentices. Yeah. Listen, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like I say that I've said that the beautiful, the, the best and worst thing about this trade is it's so like the path to business ownership is frankly easy as pie. Like everybody that's listened to this podcast, this, you know, live in the last, you know, whatever, the last one we had a hundred and, 75 people come in 175 people could go start a business tomorrow yeah. go down to your local lawyer go down to whatever and just fill out the paperwork and buy a five thousand dollar truck and you're on the road right uh that's a wonderful thing but the risk is like you say you just sort of get caught in the hamster wheel you're just like and it's always you it's always you it's always you and you know i would be in that if my boys hadn't decided if I and I'll take credit for it if I had made the trade look appealing 
and been, you know, positive about its benefits and sort of manifest the positivity, even when things were going to shit, uh, then my boys wouldn't have been interested in it. But they sort of watched it day in and day out and go, actually, I understand the stresses. I understand what he's going through, but it's it's clearly worth it because of the, you know, sort of the lifestyle that we live, the, you know, sort of the uh, smoothness of the ride and the people that you get to meet. That I mean, that's the best thing. When people ask me why I'm still in it after, you know, I'm 54, um, why am I still doing this is because I love the people that I work with and I've made fabulous relationships with those guys. Uh, that'll be there. They're literally my friend group, I guess, if you want to call it, the people that I work for. And, and there's no better way. And I, and I raise my own employees <laughs> that'll take it over in the next five years. And it'll be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Which is what it's all about, really. I miss the people the most. I miss, I miss the crew the most. Like, it was so fun to be that. Like, we had, you know, labs, training labs going and seeing young people, you know, hit their stride and, and uh, yeah. people that came from other companies that were, were disheartened and, and get them back on track. Well, you know, one thing, Bob, I wanted to tell you that I really appreciate about you. I've never. Tell you me know, what you person, appreciate me will be Dennis. Yeah. Not very many people appreciate me. <laughs> one thing I've, you're the only person I've heard say it besides myself at, at um, service, at service Titan Pantheon event last year, I spoke and about, about service Titan. I love service Titan. And I said, there's one thing that doesn't measure that might be the most important thing, and that is how many apprentices are you building at your company? And you. What are you contributing to this thing? I don't know, and I'll I'll throw shade on everybody. Nobody can tell me that number. Nobody yeah. can tell me. I, mine's thirty nine. That's all. Awesome. I've trained awesome. and brought two full, you know, seventeen from nothing to journeyman. And the rest from, you know, second, third, fourth, whatever, and turn them into whatever. And when I ask people that question, they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, you should know. Yes. Is that not what ultimately influencing is? Is you're turning, you know, rookies into vets. That they can go out and earn their stripes and provide for their families and solve problems. I mean, that's, there's no greater compliment to me. There's no thing that I'm more proud of than that is is bringing those guys along and and showing them how wonderful the trade can be. Yeah. So how did you come up with your number? Like I I don't have my number. It's a lot, but and that was always our focus. But did, are you counting people that became a licensed journeyman at your company or because at my company? Um, so if they so the only one the only ones that I would consider like graduated with me like i signed their uh fourth year papers you know what i mean mm -hmm. up here in, so in canada we have what's called a blue book and it's where you keep the record of your hours who you work for a breakdown of the it, you know it'll have like did you work on water lines drain lines service plumbing uh uh, I don't remember them all anymore. There's like eight categories and you would break it down by percentages. And then mm -hmm. I would sign it and say, I duly swear that this Dennis, the apprentice has passed his fourth year plumbing. He has, he has the, uh, uh, hours and he's, he's ready to write the test. And so that's, that's how I count it. And awesome. I, and, and which is, like I say, it's a bit unique to Canada. I don't know if they do that in, in the States where as, as the master plumber, I, I can only, ha like, I can only, um, there's only so many apprentices I can train at one time under my license. And so, um, but yeah, I don't know how to say that. And so uh, Everything's 17 different. of them started with me and finished with me. And the rest of them, you know, were at some point in the in their progression, but finished with me, and I signed up, up their books. That's awesome. And so I guess it's it's a bit easier for me to say that because that's a tangible thing, where they, you know, okay, I'm ready to go write my journeyman test. I'm like, all right, let's go through your hours, let's see mm -hmm. everything, 
check, 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 sign, send that off to the government office. Mm -hmm. They stamp it, and then you go write your test. Right. Is basically how it works. We, we have something similar where they get their, they've got to get their 6,000 hours because to, to be a residential plumber here in Washington. Yeah. And so the, you have to sign their hours, and then um, it gets notarized and sent into the state, and then they qualify as sit for the board. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the interesting thing about the states is like some of them, like I'll, I don't know if it's Philly or Texas, I can't remember, but some of them they just like as a, if, as an apprentice, I just have to show the board my W twos. I've done this much work, and I, as the master plumber, isn't necessarily involved in that process. You know what I mean? So it's sort of harder to track in yeah. that respect, but yeah. but. I I've asked Canadian guys that run their own companies. I'm like, how many of you? How many of you graduated? Oh, geez, I don't know. I'm like, you should. I think that's an, I think that's the most important number. I don't care how much money you made. How many? How many plumbers are you making? Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, here, here in Washington, we had. Um, I think I think the numbers were we had three thousand licensed gentlemen plumbers. No, but six. 6,000 licensed German plumbers and only 3,000 apprentices. Really? And it should be... It should be the opposite. 12,000 apprentices, right? And so that's kind of what I'm... I, I've been working... I've been, I've been focusing on, you know, getting apprenticeships, getting people into the trade and getting, a, like, getting apprentices going because no one really talks about that. Like, they, they have college prep. My 15-year-old's going to college prep courses right now. Yeah, but if you don't go to college, like, well, go get a job somewhere. And so I've been focusing on, okay, if you get in the trades, this is how it works, yeah. right? Like, let's get going. But um, there's so many shops out there that aren't that don't have even one apprentice. They say they can't afford it, and it's like, well, you're not charging the right price. Then and you're not charging the right prices. You're not charging the right price. No, I agree. That one's that is one thing that we absolutely agree on, and I, I mean, I would. Absolutely. Anybody listening to this, you should do that. You know, one trek exercise to find out what you're, what you need to make, and then, you know, you can debate all. You can agree with Dennis, or you can agree with me, or you can do some hybrid thing, or whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. But if, until you know that number, and it's different for every single person, like I can't say to you, Dennis, your number has to be three hundred and fifty. You're like, no, it doesn't. I'm like, yes, it does. Or you're stupid. Yeah. You're like, no. Here's my thing. This is what I've done. This is how it all works out. And so until you know that number, any other discussion is, is basically mute. Because you know what you're talking about, Yeah. right? Yeah. It's like walking in, talking to a guy on the phone about a boiler. Are you dealing with a tankless? Are you dealing with a little super hot? Are you dealing with some massive Buderis thing? Like you have no idea. So any advice you give is totally useless. So yeah. until you know basically what, what your burn rate is yeah. is that is that basically what the one trek exercise is like what you know what 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 is what is your expenditures and what do you want to make and then break that down into an hourly rate or a uh per service call out be whatever you want to call it and that's and then you can start working yeah. on it and you will absolutely find well, out what works and what doesn't for you right yeah and both and both whether you're hourly or if you've got the balls like you do to charge the right hourly price or whether you're upfront pricing and offer your options or whatever, as long as you're charging the right price is going to work. Right. Yeah. And like, I think like, like we're both getting can... to the same spot. Yeah. You're just, you know, you're over here. I mean, you're here and I'm here and we're, no, you're yeah. doing it wrong, but we're both walking Yeah. to the promised What's... land. If you want to call it that. Yeah. What, what, but what usually happens is people are charging 120 bucks an hour or something like that. They're charging some stupid number. You're charging a you're charging a healthy hourly rate. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Like you say, if that's all you are, and that's sort of the misnomer when I, I mean, that's the conflict when I say you're flat rate and I'm hourly. Well, not really. And you're not really flat rate because you're giving them five options. I'm yeah. not really hourly because my minimum is 400. You know, sixty-five dollars to ring the door. Yes. I'm not four hundred sixty-five dollars an hour, right. but if you want me to ring your, if you want to see my pretty face, you're gonna shell yeah. out 
five hundred bucks. Yeah. To see me. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's how that works. Absolutely. We got a question and, here. Um, uh, Boiler Crew says, "My fifteen-year-old is an HVAC. Why wouldn't your kid want to do what you do?" I think one of those the answer to that question is if a guy's not running his business right, why would any kid right. sign up for that? Right. If you you come home pissed every single day, throwing stuff around because and you can't you can't you know I mean we'll take the most dramatic. You can't put food on the table. You have trouble paying the rent or the mortgage or the car payment. The wife is pissed off because you know what? There's never enough money to do anything. Then he's going to be like, dude, being a plumber sucks. Yes. And why would I do that? Like, why would I subject myself to the exact same life? Right. So we can talk about, you know, the role of, I mean, since Boiler Crew said, Bobby said it, is, you know, if you're a, <laughs> if you're a bad father, then why would your kids want to follow your path? You know what I mean? Yeah, and that doesn't mean that it has to be all you know bubble gum and rainbows and wonderful things, but as you know, we can go into some other side here. If you want to be truly want to be a man to your children, then there has to be rules and there has to be enforcement and there has to be praise when they do well. Like you want to, you know, I say it all the time. I don't think I've said it much on here, but you, if your child does something that you want them to do, even if it's shitty then you got to offer all the praise in the world. You got to say, listen, man, that, that was fantastic. That's so good. You know, next time we can work on this, this, and this, but congratulations for doing it. Too many of us are do the exact opposite. Dude, you're so fucking close. That sucked. Like, come on, where's your head? And they're like, oh, I'm going to get beaten. I'm going to beat you on the head no matter what you do. And they're like, no, I'm going to go to, you know, I'll be, I'll be mean about it. I'm going to go to art school. And I'm going to learn how to draw, and or I'm going to become an engineer, the worst trade of all, and I'm going to ruin everybody's life. <laughs> yes. yes. That's, and that's how we treat our apprentices, too. We it just is. beat the hell out of them. The ones who don't want to be plumbers. And so, that does, like I say, when you say you have to treat them with, like, you, you, you can't spare the rod to do, yeah. to use a, to coin a yeah. phrase, sure. but you've got to, the first thing you got to do is offer the praise you gotta listen you fucking killed it that's so good i'd love i love what you did here i love what you did there man this you gotta you gotta work on this a bit boy like this is a bit shady yeah. how how can you fix this and you and you gotta have them come to you with the solutions how do you fix it how do you make this better tell me how you make this better and i want to know give me three op you know give me the three options of what you think you could do better and they go through one or two you're like next time we do this job you try number two and you let me know how it works out yeah and they do number two fantastic then you got to spill all the praise out and i don't you don't have to be you know over affectionate about it but you just got to let them know man that's and as men what do you need dude fantastic i love it love it that's all they need i promise you know and maybe a Pop in the back of the head, and they're yeah. off to the races. <laughs> most men are insecure. We don't want to talk about that, but most most men have a, a, a deep insecurity, and they're concerned. Yeah, that they need they need men, they need men to pat them on the back and. and yep, yeah. I couldn't them. agree more. Yeah, and and but at the same time, they need to know what they did good. I mean, you need to be specific and say, "This is what you did right, and this is what you did wrong." Yes, and and drill into that and then let them i'll say it again let them come up with the solutions for what they did wrong so it's that they start thinking like a problem i mean that's all plumbing is right yes. you got to think like a problem solver yes full stop every job you walk you into there's a problem that they're paying you to solve yeah i love what you said uh it was the last tuesday with um leon was the, the idea of of that like make people think for themselves that's what you're trying to do right are you not are we not trying like you want independent people yes so that they don't have to phone like that's the whole th it's it's and it's a i mean it's it takes years like isaiah has been a, my oldest boy who's 27 um you know he's been the plumber we'll use we'll use the we'll use the influencer definition of plumber he's been a plumber for a decade <laughs> 
He's had his ticket. He's had his ticket for two years, right? 18 months. You're coming up on two years. And he is finally, like, he rarely calls me anymore. Like, the only, he calls me with, this is what I'm going to try. I'm going to try this or this or this. What do you think, Dad? And I'm like, do try number three. I think that's your best bet. Okay, I'm going to try number three and let it know. Or he'll say, you know what? No, that's stupid. I'm going to do number one. I'm like, all right, let me know how it goes. Right? So yeah. Peter, who's 24, you know, and got his ticket in January of this year. But the influencer, he's been a tradesman for eight type of thing. He calls me all day long. Like, to agnosium. I'm like, dude, stop calling me. Figure it out for yourself. Like, dude, what are you doing? And that takes some, you know, urging and some prompting and all the rest of that stuff to say, you, you can, I believe in you. you I'm, not, I'm not setting you up for failure. I'm sitting there uh, saying, you have the potential to fix this. So you come up with what you, you think is... And it takes a while for that confidence to build. But once it's there, dude, the foundation is solid. Yes. And that's what my dad did to me. Like, he was mean to me. But when I, was, when I did write the things that were right, he's like, nice job, man. That's fantastic. And so my confidence comes from that, truly. Is my How my foundation is fabulous. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was built up by my dad. Yeah. How often do they call you because they're lonely? Well, they're married men now, so they're never lonely. <laughs> you mean their wife's brother? <laughs> when are you going to be home? <laughs> they, they, call me, they call me about woman problems now. Like, Dad, what do we do about this? I'm like, oh, that's a whole, that's a whole nother training ground, yeah. man. You got, you got 25 years to figure out how women think and work and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. So. yeah. But no. I will, just to say that, the the beautiful thing, and I'll brag a minute, is my, my boys will call me about anything. You know what I mean? Like if they're, if they're lonely or if they're upset yeah. or if they truly are having some, you know, some issues with their ladies, they'll say, hey, man, how do you, how, how do you, how do you, what's your advice on this? Yeah. Because they know that I'm not, first of all, I'm not going to mock them. You know, I'm going to take their concerns seriously, no matter what it is. And I'm going to offer some reasonable solutions. But I, and I'm not going to tell them what to do. I'm like, this, I th you can do this, this, or this. You decide what's the best path for you. It's your lady. It's your house. Figure out what works. You must feel, uh, you must feel uh, honored and blessed they even call you, right? Like, that's oh, a privilege. How many fathers? I, said, did... I don't know who I said it to. The last couple of weeks, but the greatest privilege of my whole life is I get to work with my sons every single day. I talk yeah. to them every day. We have, you know, we, we're solving problems every day. I honestly couldn't be prouder of them. They're making fabulous, you know, they're very different people. And that's been such a revelation to watch them just become their own people. They're not, they're not Bob Baker 2.0. They're literally Isaiah, and I have said that. This is one of the things that I've sort of drilled into them. When I was working for my dad, I was always Jerry's boy. Oh, you're Jerry's boy. Oh, you're Jerry's boy. And it took 20 years before I became Bob Baker. Oh, you're Bob Baker. And for a decade, while these boys are working for me, they're like, oh, you're Bob's kid. Oh, what's your name again? You're Bob's kid. And that's literally changed with Isaiah. He's like, oh, I, we want Isaiah to come. Don't send Bob, send Isaiah. Yeah. Right? Because Bob's too grouchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we like Isaiah's personality or whatever the case may be. Like they, the, it'll come to a point, and it's already happened, particularly with my daughter who plays basketball. Uh, they're like, oh, you're, you're, Brooks, you're Brooks' dad. I'm like, I am Brooks' dad. <laughs> yes, I am. And that's, that's the only sort of, affirmation i need is oh they know me because of my kids what what better thing is there nothing yeah, yeah. ever yeah it's been the greatest transformation of my whole life is to go from jerry's kid to brooks dad it's fabulous it truly is 
And I wish, I wish that happens to all of you guys yeah. with your own kids, whether they work for you or not, that you, get, you become known as their dad. It's awesome. Yes. Greatest thing in the world. Yeah. I want my kids to outshine me, too. That's another thing. I it's agree. Like, I want them to outshine me. I don't want to be alpha. I want them to do better. Your father is the only dude, or your father should be the only dude in the world that will not be jealous or competitive if you do better than him. If you do it yeah. right. Yeah. Right? If, you're, if my kids do better than me, I, I can't even tell you how proud I'll be. There's no, there's no competition there. There's no jealousy. I'm like, dude, you're amazing. Yeah. And that's, you know, in a world that's incredibly competitive, as you know, that's a, a rarity to have somebody that's just happy for you and proud of you because of what you're doing. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome super stuff. Rare. Super rare. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about your beard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I have been clean shaven my entire, but I'll tell you, Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I've been clean shaven my entire life and my darling mother, um, went in for, uh, kidney stone surgery and she was supposed to be there for two, three days. They, the doctor phoned me after two days and said, Hey, come and, uh, come and get her. She's doing fantastic. That's, uh, uh let's get her out out of here we have you know we need the bed blah 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 and so i picked her up and was driving her home she was staying in my basement because she had knee surgery the year before and so she was 69 getting up there a bit and and uh we just you know just to keep an eye on her and then she was going to go back to her house and at over the summer and she said to me hey, i had sort of grown my you know had the uh the stuff all had you know been a couple of weeks since i shaved and she looked looked at me and she said, you know, Bob, you look really good with a beard. And I was like, oh, thanks, mom. That's, I appreciate that. And we sort of talked about whatever. And she went to sleep that night and never woke up. And, and, uh, <laughs> um, I know it's terrible. Thank you. Just give for me sharing. a second. <laughs> oh, Bob, thank you for and sharing. And I had the doctor phone me like two days later and say, what happened? And I was in a really bad mood. And I said, what the fuck? What are you phoning me for? What do you mean what happened? I don't know what happened. I have no idea. And so, unfortunately, we did the full autopsy. And the, the medical examiner of Alberta phoned me and said, listen, Bob, I don't know how to tell you this, but we have no idea what happened. She just passed away. And I'm convinced my dad had died 12 years previous. Um, that my dad showed up in the middle of the night and said, dude, you got, you got five minutes to decide. Are you coming with me or are you staying here? Mm -hmm. And I think she just decided to go. And so yeah. that's sort of, we had the funeral and I just sort of, that's sort of the last thing she ever said to me. And so I said, you know what? I'm, it's going to, it's going to take a while, uh, but I'm growing a beard. And if I'm ever over that sort of moment in my life, I may shave it, but I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, thank you. Nobody ever sharing. asked me why I grew the beard, so there it is. <laughs> Bob, thank you for sharing. That's amazing. It's a, yeah. Listen, I had wonderful, wonderful parents. They're just, I can't say enough about them. And they provided a wonderful foundation. And that's my only, my, it's my only worry, frankly, is to be able to provide the same for my, for my own kids. Yeah. And, um, and, and give them just the foundation that I feel I was given. And, and it sort of is a, a, it's certainly a motivating factor in my life. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I'm passionate about the trades is because I think it's a great opportunity for kids, for guys to be able to keep their wife at home, raising the kids. Like, listen, I'm a single income earner and have been for 30 years, me too. you know, and that, that in today's day and age, I think that's possible in today's day and age. If you, uh, you know, sort of take it slowly and do it right and look after, look after the things that you need to look after. 
Um, yeah. It's wonderful. And like, and like I said previously, you know, my kids wanted for nothing. Doesn't mean that we, you know, went you know, water skiing every weekend or, you know, lived some crazy luxurious, luxurious life. We lived a life that was, you know, I mean, we lit, we, everybody had jobs out here on the farm and uh, it was a, it was a, it was a hardworking, but uh, rewarding life. And I, yeah. what else is there? At the end of the day, yeah. So sorry about that personal thing. Usually, I'm a you know grizzly old man that hates everybody, but uh, there's lots of I don't know who I told it to. I was making fun of the tattoos, and you know, they're like, well, we all use that for you know catharsism and make ourselves feel better about whatever. And I'm like, yeah, well, the beard does the same thing for me, and that's a story for another time. But now it's out on the internet. So thanks a lot, Dennis. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I. I find the the beards are pretty personal. I Tank a couple of years ago now. Tank the plumber yeah. had a beard. And he, he, he did the same. We had a long chat about it actually, and yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was, yeah. He was you know when he shaved it, it was it was quite emotional for him. So yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So a lot of, yeah. like I say, I have no plans of. I'm not. It's still very much. Uh, it is. It's a reminder of lots of wonderful memories and and sort of like i say the last thing my mom said to me and so uh i'm not sure it's going anywhere very soon yeah awesome you know did you know i used to be a mortician did you really yeah i did not know that how long were you a mortician um i still am but i did that, that practice uh, don't say did, you're a mortician now you got bodies in your basement or what <laughs> i did you know, last year I did, What's that? I did about 10 funerals. I've done about 10 funerals a year for the last 20 years. Oh, really? Like yeah. prepared the bodies? The whole thing, yeah. Yeah, mostly, really? for, mostly for church friends and stuff. But yeah, I did so that are for you, six uh, years. Are you a licensed minister then too? You must be. I'm a licensed celebrant. They, we okay. We call them a celebrant, but um, I, usually a minister does it. But yeah, I, I did that for six years. And then my dad, my father-in-law had heart issues yeah you were saying that. that's what got you in the plumbing got me over there so um but i kept my license and people would call me and i would i would take care of most people i knew but so are you actually a plumber then i'm not actually a plumber no there you go secrets nope. revealed yeah no nope. for bar banter and all the secrets are revealed <laughs> no secret at all i i uh I came over to be a plumber. I, I value very much. Like I can do every single thing in the mortuary. World. No, no. I, and I'm, yeah. I, you know, I'm busting your job. No, no, but it, no, I, I, that was the goal. But then he had a, three months after I got there, he had another heart attack. And so yeah. it forced me to jump in, into a different world. But you know what it did though? It made me appreciate my plumbers. Unlike a plumber could appreciate them. Like I couldn't fire a guy and say, get out. I'll finish it myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so, like I did every day. <laughs> Get the hell out of here! I can do this myself. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I forced me to hire competent guys because I couldn't do it myself, right? And yeah. so, anyway. So, do you work out. out of a? Do you work out of your own? Do you have a funeral home, or you do you do you just sort of show up and say, "I'm going to do this one"? No. Uh, like, is it different down in the states? Because that's pretty, you know, you know, yeah, uh, intimate. Yes, you know, you know what I mean. So this is what this is what happens. So in, in most big metropolitan cities, there there will be a company down here. It's called First Call Plus. And so if in a, in a funeral home, if you're running a funeral and you have someone die, you call them up and they'll go remove the body, and they might even embalm for you until you can wait on the family. So um, so I use that service, and then I would go to the house to make the arrangements. Oh. And I discovered, okay. I discovered when I worked at the funeral home, like the I would ask the people, do you want to come to the funeral home or do you want me to come to the house? And everybody said, oh, if you would please come to Who the wants house. to go to a cold, strange, yeah. dark, weird funeral home? So I kind of had it's set that nice up. It's quite nice here. Yeah. So did you actually do the embalming? Yeah, totally. No, yes. nice. I'm a, we have a licensed embalmer and yeah, that's my. We do. Uh, we do quite a few funeral homes, or we used to. I don't do much anymore. But there was nothing 
like we would go in late at night to work on you know the plumbing system yeah and they'd have like six six dudes in there my favorite my favorite funeral home story is the guys the guys like hey are you good with bodies i'm like yeah i'm totally fine so we walk down into the embalming room and there you know this is a bit x-rated but there's there's like a there's like a nine you know, 80 year old grandma that her sheet's down and she obviously has had work done like she's yes. <laughs> out to here because as you know everything goes flat yeah right everything unless yeah. it's fake yeah because there's no blood pressure to keep everything sort of perky yeah. anyway she, I, he was so embarrassed and that's one of those it's one of those core me- you know having those core memories like i can literally i don't know who she was <laughs> thankfully i don't and but some poor family some plumber saw their grandma topless you know, with uh-huh. with a fantastic set, by the yeah. way, and he's like, "Oh my gosh!" and goes and throws something a- over, and I'm mm-hmm. like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna need a minute here to before I sort of figure out what our, you know, how what I'm gonna fix for you." But <laughs> that was a scene. The embalmer is never supposed to leave the body uncovered. No, no, I agree. Like everyone that we would, you know, I, I you know, I had sort of seen if as we were working, and they might have been working sort of, you know, up to, you know, they were covered to the shoulders type of thing. But I had never seen, you know, everything. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reason I brought that up, because I was making arrangements for a guy, and he was buying the best of everything for his aunt. And so I kind of said, well, this is, you're taking, you're really taking good care of your aunt. And he said, well, she deserves it. And... um so I could tell he was successful. He's just a nice man. And then I, he asked me about, about myself, and I said we've decided we decided to, you know, my my wife's pregnant, and so we've decided to, um, she's going to stay home and raise the kids, and we're going to live off of whatever I can make. We've decided that, and and he stopped, put his pen down, and said, "That's the best." peace that your children are well taken care of like you don't have to worry about doctor appointments and school and homework yeah. he's like when you when you've got someone that you can trust at home you're going to do better in business because of that and i found that to be true like you have employees that have to rush home because the kids got this or that or or whatever and and rebecca being home was a, a total blessing for our kids and for myself right i, I was agree. able to be more productive at work yeah and so I do think, and I, you know, I'm not giving anybody grief that's sort of in that situation. I do think that's the best scenario possible. It's if you can, if you can provide and your lovely bride can be at home to look after sort of the necessities of home and you give her some time to get out of the house and do her own thing a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that she doesn't feel like a prisoner of the, of the home, but so she can sort of express herself out there. I, I don't think there's a better system for it. And I, and again, like I continue to harp on, I think the trades can provide that. If you, once you sort of figure out, you know, your, as we'll say 10,000 times, your, your, your one man expense and what your, what it costs to run your little company and then, and then implement the elements that need to, that, that need to happen to make it real. Yeah. It's kind of Bobby, how that works. Bob, you're, you're, you're convincing me that we have to talk about pricing more because like all these guys, like if they're pricing right, they can they can have a a, be, a more a, a, a better family life, and they can take care of their They can we're hire gonna, apprentices. We're gonna run stuff. up on our, our next hour, so why don't we why don't we why don't we set a date for a couple three weeks from now, and sure. or if you want to do it sooner, that's fine too. Ten days or whatever, and we can talk about you know sort of how to zero in on your price, like what is your price, and, and all these chachis that are in here now. Bring your notepad and pen and Let's do it. start writing it down. Not, oh, not, not, yeah, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, a couple of weeks, whatever works for you. I'll, I'll DM you. All right, Bob. Thank you so much. It was, it was such a pleasure. <laughs> it was awesome. Yes, yeah. I appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, these are all secrets. Don't be telling anybody any anything we talked about. You chachi. They had to be on the live to know. Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. right. Thanks, Dennis. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, you too. We'll chat Take soon. We'll right. chat offline too. Thanks, buddy. Sounds good. Bye.